Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to address you, our distinguished audience, and to our collaboration with our expert panelists to exciting and dynamic one uh, that is attracting a lot of intrigue uh, from people from all walks of life, the investment world, governments, and that is uh, the great wealth transfer. One estimate states that over 68 trillion in private wealth will be transitioned from one generation of the, to another in the USA alone by 2060. Gen X and millennial inheritors of ultra high net worth individuals and family offices uh, are known to be more ESG conscious, tech savvy, embrace disruptive new trends, and they lead the charge in this tidal wave of generational wealth transfer. But the big question has always been is, will their role as the top 1%, as, as you would call it, of inheritors lead to a positive social impact, financial stability, and a greater wealth distribution? Or will this enormous uh, flow of private wealth lead to the few controlling the majority? But specifically to dive a bit deeper, the purpose of this presentation and panel is due to there being a substantial flow of this private transfer occurring over the forthcoming generation from baby boomers to the next gens. But there is still that lack of understanding of values, interests, areas of focus that the ne next generation are so passionate about. And at the apex of this phenomenon are the ultra high net worth and family office community. Um, and for those that are not aware that are tuning in, uh, a family office is a, a, a family with private investable assets in the range of 100 million US dollars or more. And in some cases, many, many sums greater than this in, into the several billions. But why is the topic so pivotal? Why is it important? Well, an ENY study um, from 2016 estimated that there are 10,000 plus single family offices alone a purported tenfold increase since 2008. And in additionally, there's often a great mystique and limited engagement, collaborations, um, entrepreneurship, investments, uh, in, in investments, entrepreneurship, the arts, um, creative, philanthropic, and social impact initiatives with ultra high net worth individuals, family offices, and particularly their more innovative tech savvy and socially conscious um, with this uh, all important next generation. How should you go about forging long term relationships based on collaboration, co creation, and co elevation? of like-minded values with this important and growing category of investor, entrepreneur, artist, uh, creator, philanthropist, and social impact edge walker. As many of our audience are from corporate, governmental, and institutional backgrounds, the core principles, ethics, and values behind the next gen succession provides opportunities and complementary synergies that may otherwise not have been obvious without a more focused perspective. So to answer some of those burning questions, demystify the mindset and core issues uh, pertaining to the great wealth transfer to the next generation uh, and of their role going forward as the one percent. Without further ado, it will be my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished panelists. Firstly, Jess Jacobs, who is an artist, philanthropist and the co-founder of Invisible Pictures USA. Welcome, Jess. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And uh, Maya Kedar, who is the Chief Culture Officer of Brain Pop USA. Welcome, Maya. Welcome. And uh, Vikas Desai, who is the founder and partner of Wellcan Capital USA. Welcome, Vikas. Really, really well. And uh, David Homan, who is the CEO of Orchestrator Connecting USA. Hi, thank you, Peter. And finally, last but not least, David Reed Chang, who is the co-founder of Intergen.Family USA. Welcome, David. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm Peter J.R. Aylwin, uh, director of ATOS Limited and ATOS Holdings. 
Now, look, uh, this is the, now now we're going to get into the sort of the exciting part of the discussion. Uh, and and a, a key component of it is always to understand the perspective of the individual, their background, and it really takes the lens off who they really are uh, and what is is uh, the, uh, the the core values and the motivations behind an individual. That I think is a bit of a misconception that 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 is um, often evolves around the next generation um, of of the family office and ultra high net worth world. Is there is a lack of understanding of of, of what drives the people. So look, uh, in approximately one minute, just kindly share with us a little bit about your background, uh, what led you to becoming to be interested or affiliated with the next generation to the great wealth transfer. Why don't we start with you, um, uh, Maya? Well, hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Peter. Um, so uh, my name is Maya Kadar Kowalski, and I am uh, the chief culture officer of our family company, which is called Brain Pop. We're um, an education technology company um, servicing mostly the United States, but also uh, worldwide. And um, being in that space, so our, our basically our family business, privately owned, is a social impact business, essentially. Um, and beyond that, we also have a family foundation uh, that focuses on innovative education. Um, and we are very interested in finding new models uh, of education that will scale well. Um, and so that's, that's basically uh, what our, where our interests lie. Thank you, Maya. And Jess as well, same thing. We'd love to know a little bit about your background and some of your interests that led you into this uh, world of next generation, great wealth and great wealth transfer. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. Um, and it's such an honor to be on this panel with such amazing um, co-panelists. So thank you for having me. Um, I'm Jess Jacobs. I um, I come from a very entrepreneurial family based out of Southern California, focused in the telecom space. Um, I, I was always kind of okay with math and science, um, but really uh, moved into the artistic world when I was a teenager. So I started working professionally as an actor then, and then moved into, um, into running my own production company at the age of 24. Um, we focused really on, um, on authentic storytelling, so putting people with lived experience at the center of their own stories. Um, and it's a for-profit business that we run, but I also started to see the opportunity to really leverage some of the assets that I've inherited from my family as a philanthropist as well. And so really understanding the power of philanthropic investment in, in culture work, in storytelling, um, to to change hearts and minds to really move the needle um, on some of the issues that all of us care so much about. For me specifically, I'm really focused on reproductive health rights and justice. Um, and specifically now I'm, I'm, I'm in my like late 20s. So I'm really excited to start to take kind of a lot of the stuff that I've learned and really start to overlap the, the arts and the, the activism and, and advocacy that I've been so passionate about for the last couple of years. Yeah, in, indeed, uh, Jess, there's, there's, that's a discussion in, in and of itself, uh, but uh, just, the, just the power of the arts, uh, power of celebrity, power of story that resonates and touches the heart of uh, so many people is, is something that can't always be measured in dollars or cents, it's, it, but, it, but it makes you know, lasting, sustainable impact uh, amongst a generation. Very, very that's intriguing. Right. And Vikas, I'd love to learn a bit about your background and how you became uh, associated with the Great Wealth Transfer and NextGen. For sure. Uh, and, and thanks, Peter, and uh, glad to be on the panel. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, per personally, I, I started uh, WellCan Capital, which is a cannabis-focused uh, venture firm. And so we've been heavily involved in the cannabis industry for over three years now. Um, you know, excited about the space, given, you know, obviously the growth in the industry, but the, the positive sort of impact, I think, the industry will have um, from a medical perspective. Um, you know, started looking on this at, at the industry on behalf of, uh, of half my family, which um, uh, you know were immigrants, uh, to, you know, parents were immigrants to this country, um, and uh, built built a business in infrastructure construction as well as healthcare, real estate, um, and uh, you know started seeing the overlap from the you know the healthcare side of things and uh, and the cannabis space. I, I think uh, it's also a sector that has a strong social justice uh, component to it, um, given the challenges um, that many have faced, you know, 
during the time of, or still in, you know, today of, uh, during the time of prohibition. Um, so, you know, personally, I've just been excited about, um, you know, being involved in the industry from multiple facets. Um, and, and that's one that's important to me. And then, um, you know, also navigating the shift of, um, the, the priorities of a, um, uh, of first generation immigrants versus, you know, the second generation, sort of how, how those priorities shift uh, over time. So. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Vikas. Um, David Herman, uh, again, uh, definitely a, th- a thought leader and an expert on, on many of these subject matters. But uh, please share with us uh, your connection and how you got involved with the Great Wealth Transfer and particularly the next generation community. Of course. And thank you, Peter. And welcome all. Um, I wear two hats in this regard. One is as the New York ambassador to Nexus, which is a global community, uh, family offices and social impact focused um, individuals, as well as the CEO of Orchestrated Connecting, uh, which is a affiliate of Nexus and a community I run, which represents over 300 family offices and venture capitalists, all with an impact lens. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. And finally, uh, David Chang, uh, who I came to know very, very well uh, in his uh, uh, alliance that Indigen, his company had with our Family Office Association. Uh, But please elaborate upon uh, your background and what attracted you to this, uh, this segment. Thank you, Peter, um, and fellow distinguished panelists. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, For me, uh, uh, my family has been involved in um, many different fields, including uh, mergers and acquisitions, um, campaigns and elections, directors and boards, uh, publications such as these. Um, Also, uh, questions of engineering and inventions. Um, And I've been interested in this question of um, what shall we do with what we've been given? Uh, You know, um, in 2011, I made an introduction um, that led to the founding of Nexus. I wasn't one of the founders like Rachel or Jonah, but I made an introduction that led to the first fiscal sponsor being found and Nexus being catalyzed. And so that was a great gift and an honor for me to be of support to that tremendous, tremendous movement and institution known as Nexus. Um, so that was, that was really a momentous time for me. And I got involved um, by f- helping to found a group called Invest in Yourself, which did a lot of work looking at personal growth and development. David Homan was one of our first attendees and, and uh, enthusiasts of our programs. And that I remember us connecting on our love for Viktor Frankl and his inspiration. Um, so basically, um, yeah, and then later I helped to develop the Purpose Lab and helped to catalyze other labs within that community. So I would say, um, and then the Family Office Association, we did many events through an intergenerational track, um, many cities uh, for over a couple of years. So after reaching out to thousands of next-gen family members, uh, impact investors and social entrepreneurs, I realized it's important to look at these questions of becoming value of intergenerational learning. Um, So how do we really uh, work with what we've been given and how do we honor the systems and structures that are currently in place and evolve them to be more holistic and more regenerative so that we can create truly a world that works for all and we can leverage our privilege and our wealth for healing and for transformation because we're in a world of pain as we know. But yeah, um, David, that, David, I yeah. think we're going to you're, you're, you're going to have an ample chance to elaborate upon that, uh, because yeah. that's that's really leading into the next question. But uh, thank, thank you, you for that, that, that uh, introduction. It's, it's very inspiring. And yes, I, I have also attended uh, some intergen uh, events and, and found them to be extraordinarily uh, uh, game changing and certainly thought provoking and uh, yeah, cultivating great, great, great thought. But what we'll do now is we'll get to the heart of the matter of what we're here to address uh, as, as part of the uh, official summary of the discussion. And, that, and is what do you feel is the responsibility of the top 1% of all inheritors that they presently play? From your own unique perspective and interests, what do you feel is the most appropriate direction forward when it comes to positive social impact, 
financial stability and greater wealth distribution during the coming wealth transfer in the USA and or internationally. Why don't we start with you again, Maya? I don't know if I like being first all the time. I just want to point that out. <laughs> but I'll, because of course, as everybody was going around, I was like, oh, I should have said that too. All right. Anyway, but to get uh, to get back to the point. So yeah, I think that um, I think that it's a very big, you know, uh, privilege to be in a place to to be able to discuss these things. Um, and that the, the, the biggest, uh, value that I want to express in this group is that I really think it makes sense to, um, to think in a scalable way, to think in ways that we can, uh, give back in ways that affect and give impact, um, over a large scale. Um, so, so that's like the way, you know, when we as philanthropists come together as a family, I think that we also bring our sort of our business brain with us as we are looking at, uh, at ways to, to make a difference. Um, some of the fields that, that we're interested in, and I'm speaking for my family, but I, this is the one that I actually is my own personal one, is that intergenerational um, education. So like the idea, for instance, of having like a kindergarten in uh, an old age home. Um, so where you can bring the two uh, different um uh, extremes of, 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 of generation knowledge, I guess, and bring them together in order to, to create an exchange. And I think that this is, it's just one example, but it's an example of the way we can create communities and shared understandings and really, um, value set from a very, uh, from a, from a very young age and, and, and assist in social emotional learning. And this is all the stuff that, you know, you've seen recently through this, uh, crazy year that we've experienced with a lot of social un un unrest and things that, that have come to the fore. I think that we really would be essentially creating a better society if we were able to uh, connect uh, between, between generations. So, so that's, that's, that's the thing that I feel passionate about. And, uh, and, but, but, but the idea is looking, looking for whatever, whatever it is that you're passionate about, looking for ways to, um, to create change, I think, and impact on a, on a larger scale. Yeah, no, that, very, very brilliant insights. Uh, thank you kindly for that, uh, Maya. And Jess, again, same question. What do you feel is the responsibility and role of the top 1%? And from your own unique perspective and interests, what do you feel is the pro appropriate direction forward when it comes to social impact, financial stability, and uh, greater wealth distribution um, during this great wealth transfer? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think it's there is always immense responsibility when you come from a position of privilege to redistribute, whether that's wealth and or power, you know, and or um, and or any other sort of form of influence or capital. And I think that in this exact moment with COVID, we're seeing this K curve kind of like continue um, to 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 shift drastically in, in opposite directions that we're seeing in the midst of a recession, the wealthy get wealthier and the, um, the folks who are impoverished become uh, more and more so. And so I think, you know, the responsibility has always been great. And I am feeling these days like it is um, greater and also more urgent than ever. I think the fact that we are about to face the greatest wealth transfer in history shows that, you know, this sort of extreme capitalist system is is working very well for a very, very small number of people. And um, I would argue that that's, that that's inappropriate. And, and I think that the sort of the way to start to tackle some of this redistribution is to operate in community. It is so easy for folks with wealth privilege to be isolated in either our own family offices, our own, you know, homes, Again, with COVID, obviously, we've all been isolated in a really profound way um, on top of that. But I have found such joy and such opportunity and such intersectionality um, from, from an issues perspective in really collaborating with other next gen folks. Um, and actually, to, to Maya's point, um, in collaborating with my family, um, collaborating with my grandparents, my parents, um, the other sort of members of my generation, to really start to be able to figure out how to move the needle in a meaningful way to do some of that kind of transformation and healing that David Chang was talking about. Um, my, my mom and I have recently started to co-fund a project with a, a large international NGO, and it's been such a joy to be able to work with her um, and, and have also started to build community with other um, high net worth individuals in this kind of political education space. So really saying, what is what can we learn from this current moment with COVID and 
And how can we bring that into our giving moving forward, focused on political organizing, on movement building, um, focusing mm -hmm. on Black lives, LGBTQ folks, um, just people that are that are the most directly impacted by the issues of our day and really committing to investing directly in them. closer and um it's 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 what, what one of the fondest memories i have of, of my interactions with family is what we've co-created together mm -hmm. um and you can feel that transition of knowledge and passion and uh positive energy go from that generation to the next and i think that is one area that has been missing from the conversation from a lot of people that look at the next gen um and family office segment is in fact that they are families at the end of the day it's not about assets under management it's about the legacy that you leave and and, and getting back to that um uh, course uh, vicus uh, uh, again same question okay what do you feel is the responsibility and role of the top one percent and what do you think is the most uh, appropriate direction forward in, in in your opinion and based upon your interests and focus um yeah look i i would echo what um, everyone has said so far, right? There, there's an immense amount of responsibility. Um, and I think the redistribution of wealth uh, and sort of the, uh, you know, the democratization of access, which I think the access sort of also creates um, that diversity uh, uh, that uh, between the, the wealthy and, and the, you know, um, the non-wealthy in, in terms of disparity that we're currently seeing. And so, um, and, and that something having that I'm highly sensitive to as a second generation immigrant because, uh, you know, our, our first generation sort of came from nothing. Right. And so you, when you when you come from that and you create something, I think it puts a different emphasis on how do you then give people that same access and opportunity that like uh, we are now afforded, um, but that prior generations may not have been afforded. Um uh, and how do you ensure that 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 others get the access to the the, the same resources um, uh, as well, right? And so, um, personally, that's something that I'm sensitive to. That um, we've talked a lot about, sort of in, in in our family. And I think one of the you know one of the key ways, um, uh, especially sort of outside the U.S., is is around you know a access to education, um, especially in rural areas. So, for example, we're pretty active in rural India. Um, in terms of, um, you know, creating a foundational framework um, and supporting institutions that, um, you know, provide access to education for the untouchable caste, for example. And that sort of allows them to free, um, uh, free themselves of, of some of the repression that they've seen. And so ultimately, from our perspective, um, you know, there's there's few things that put you on equal footing. I think education is one of them, but finding the various ways to uh, to give um to give others that opportunity because it shouldn't be just meant um, for the 1%. Um, so. I, I, I couldn't agree more there, uh, Vikas. And matter of fact, I've lived in India for many years. So, and I, I cut my entrepreneurial teeth there, but in particular got a great exposure to philanthropy and social impact there. And, and, and what the, the sort of the ultra high net worth individuals do there to actually give back to the communities. But it's interesting when you take that uh, work ethic from a, uh, say a, a developing country and take that over to a developed country such as America. And because America is also comprising a lot of entrepreneurs and first and second generation, there is a very, very different mindset behind the family dynamic in the family office and the next gens because they have actually really been parented and they've uploaded some of that entrepreneurial spirit and fire and passion. Whereas when it, it, it I'm not saying that it, it doesn't certainly exist in, in other multi, multi-generational families, but some of them, when the family goes to being a money manager um, and they're not connected to, to business or the, the, the values and, and or, and or the, the source of the business that cultivated the wealth, it can create a, 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 a different uh, dimension to that. Uh, where it can be somewhat more institutionalized or more professionally managed. So it's interesting, yes, how we've got a panel of, of very much the human touch that have been uh, developed and cultivated and parented with the values of their, their family, which is very intriguing. David, again, same same question. I mean, what do you feel is the role of the top 1%, uh, David Herman? And um, 
and, and, and the inheritors um, uh, play. And from your perspective, um, what do you feel uh, is uh, the best direction forward they should take? Hey, uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, definitely saving the two Davids for last could cause confusion. It does when we're in the same room sometimes. Um, I, I root most of what I believe in how change happens in behavioral psychology. And I live to read things that are everyone finds incredibly boring until I'm able to make them exciting. So here we go. Um, there was a study done of the top 50 cities in the world of what happens when people cross the street and a car's coming. And almost without exception, when you start to cross the street, you run across the street, even if the safest thing is to step backwards. And so in terms of wealth transfer, it is moving forward and that is inevitable. And in terms of that, all of my friends on this panel here and many in the communities I run or I'm part of, they're moving forward. They're already doing incredible things. And so as a um, father of two young kids, and I'll give you the example of my four-year-old, the other day he went across the street and he, like millions of other people, when he saw a car coming, ran across, even though it wasn't the right thing to do. He really <laughs> should have just taken a step back because he was on his tricycle and I had to hold his hand, grab the tricycle and get across. We made it. That is then where, with respect to Maya, I'd be like, I should impart my parental wisdom, but I was also just glad we didn't get hit. But when you think about that in terms of the psychology, these are forces that are already moving. How we define what they are and how we value the people doing it, there is no greater person despite family history to leverage their family forward than the next gen. And it's not by asking, it's by doing. And by setting an example of passions, what comes from that, and I found with very few exceptions, is not just an acceptance of that next gen social and cultural values, but a willingness to engage to some degree with them because once you're crossing the street with your kid, then you're across, you've crossed, and it's very hard to go back when you're in a position of prominence. Instead, what I find is most people look deeper, dig deeper and say, if this is valuable to somebody I've imparted my wisdom to, then let me figure out how it's valuable to us as a family. Yeah. Thank you very much, David Herman. David Chang, exactly the same question. I mean, what do you feel is the role of that 1%? And in your opinion, what is the best direction forward? Thank you, Peter. Um, well, first, I would say that as simplistic as this sounds, um, you know, people need to be asking the question, you know, have you become who you've, who, who you've been asked to become? Are you, you know, have you found a way to become yourself and yet belong to your family if possible? So when you come in and then you're asking the question, are you who you're intended, who you intended to be? Um, these are very personal questions. Uh, they're very deep questions. And in a certain way, they're kind of like destiny agreements that you have with yourself. And the question is, can we make those destiny agreements with each other? Um, and can we also move beyond, let's say, our comfort zones or our bubbles that we might be in? And so for a lot of us, you know, we all have different types of pains, different types of suffering. And for some, it might be more material, physical. Others, it might be more emotional or mental or spiritual. So the themes that were brought up earlier, um, particularly uh, by Maya and Jess, relating to looking at the subjects of our stories. Um, are we honoring our stories and each other's stories? Are we learning how to walk in each other's shoes or each other's moccasins, as some Native American metaphors speak of? Are we actually um, cultivating empathy and compassion and even mercy uh, is, is a word that some um, philanthropists know, philanthropists that I know speak of. So what is our capacity to recognize um, systemic challenges and look to create s uh, systems that are more fair, fair and equitable and regenerative in nature uh, rather than those that support, let's say, the zero sum game where winner takes all? Um, so how do we create systems and structures um, that honor uh, who we are at a deeper level of our humanity um, rather than feel as though we have to just deal with a culture that might be more um, zero-sum game or more materialistic than we might, th than we might actually want to have? So I would say the bottom line to the question is we get to choose based on what we're paying attention to 
And speaking of disruptive technologies, because that was in the session description, Peter, sometimes we need to make sure that we're not disrupting our quality of life and disrupting our time where the speed of trust is being sacrificed because the speed of technology is so fast that we're forgetting who we are to ourselves, to our families, and to each other. And so how do we widen the conversation of what is family, what is humanity, and who is the next gen? Mm -hmm. no, thank you very much, David. Very, very uh, uh, deep and insightful. Um, for, for the, uh, with the summary, and that is that argument that's often presented, that, the, again, the 1% of private wealth holders will control the majority. That's a, a, a perception. However, as stated in the summary of this discussion, Gen X uh, and millennial inheritors, the 1% are known to be more ESG, social impact conscious, tech savvy, creative, disruptive and all things. And I think anyone tuning in would, would, would completely uh, understand that dynamic now, having uh, had a taste of uh, the viewpoints of several of our, our panelists here. And there's also substantial new initiatives in the US and internationally uh, on sustainability, gender equality and social impact. So look, with this, this all in mind, uh, I'll direct this one this time to Jess. Uh, do you feel that inevitably the top 1% will end up inevitably focusing on controlling the majority? And if so, why? Or do you actually feel that this generation is different to the patriarchal generation? Uh, and what do you feel the path will look like for that 1% going forward? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, and I think, you know, my caveat would be that I don't have a crystal ball and that next gens are not a monolith. So, you know, what, what I'll, what I'll speak to will, will sort of try to capture as much of sort of my thoughts on the subject as possible, but with those caveats. In terms of the top 1% controlling the majority, I think that there is something about this next generation of folks that understands that we actually, as ultra high net worth people, are not better off for controlling more of the wealth. That are in like everybody in our systems, including sort of your sort of the, the person with the least sort of connection to oppression, down to the person who is who is navigating the intersection of multiple oppressions. We are all going to be better off from a society and a system that treats all of us with dignity, respect, with opportunity, equal access, and all of that. So, I think you know if we're talking about controlling the majority. Um, I think that the next gen understands because of our intersecting lives, because of technology, because of our ability to communicate with one another, because of how we have developed into not only a global economy, but in so many ways, a global community through social media, through, I think, storytelling, I think through partnerships, all of these things that there really is an understanding on the part of next gen inheritors that, um, that we won't benefit from sort of controlling a majority. There's this uh, incredible writer that I work with who uses a metaphor of famine, which is that if there's a famine and you're, you have a lot of food in your tent, you better watch out. You better be watching your door. You're not safe because people are gonna come in and want your food. They need to feed their families. But if you keep what is enough for you, and you distribute the rest of the food for other people, everybody is safe. You can have a, a, a harmonious society or at least a more harmonious society. And I think that that's so true. And I think that this next gen really understands that. I think additionally, the other thing that I would add is that um, we are no longer siloed from an issue perspective. I think there was a lot of focus on like, arts and culture philanthropy and climate philanthropy and women's and gender, you know, sort of gender related philanthropy. And um, it is no longer the case that we are that we are looking at things from these different standpoints. I think taking a 360 degree look at the issues that we care about and looking at social justice as a whole and the intersection of of climate, of economic opportunity, of reproductive health rights, justice, mm -hmm of, you know, of all of these things means that, you know, there is, there is a sort of a more progressive and a more holistic point of view that this generation is taking on, on change work. And I think that's from an issue area standpoint and as well from an approach, I think the ESG investing, I think philanthropy, I think research kind of has a different role these days, thinking about qualitative as well as quantitative research. So in, so in summary, so in summary, Jess? So in summary, uh, <laughs> um, 
I mean, my answer would be, I hope not. I think that we are really in a moment where this, this next generation of inheritors sees the value in, in collaboration, in co-creation and, you know, in, in sort of working together rather than, than working to kind of uh, promote our own, our own sort of status um, or, or protecting just ourselves. Indeed, yes, and yeah, and I think it takes it takes knowing the individual rather than judging the masses or, or a stereotype. I think is key. Uh, again, Maya, same question. I mean, do you think uh, it will will inevitably be the one percent controlling um, the majority, or is this next generation different? And if so, how do you feel it is? I couldn't agree more with what with like everything that Jess said. I just want to say that. Um, <laughs> But basically, you know, there's no, you know, again, we can't speak for every single person within this um, next gen, but I can tell you that there is so much more openness to wanting to improve the world in in general. Um, And that's just maybe like the zeitgeist of that, of this generation, I think. Um, And again, a willingness to learn a, a, a much more open approach to both, you know, what, how we, how we get learned about certain topics Um, and so, and, and I think, and sharing and, and the fact that we're talking about this stuff, it it just makes us all, it like ups the ante for, for, for the whole generation. And I do think that there's something about, of course, as, as as we see the divide really become a, a much bigger divide with, with, uh, time, I, I just don't see how we won't be able to, we'll have to, we'll be forced to, to want to, uh, you know, to help because there, there will be people who will be in, in such disadvantage, um, and so I just think that, 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 I mean, again, I'm very much the optimist. So <laughs> I want to say that, that, that I, but I would really hope that that's the case. Um, and I, and I know that from the, from, from the community of people that I have come in contact with, that that is certainly the feeling that is certainly the desire. Yeah. Thank you very much, Maya. And again, Vickers, same question. Um, yeah, look, I, I would also say I couldn't agree more with um, everything that was said up to this point. Um, you know, from for, for my sort of you know, small peer set as well, I, I think it's uh, it's clearly a priority. Um, and it's clearly that, that's something that's, that, that's on people's minds. I think some of that is derived from the uh, the access to information, to community, to diverse experiences um, that allow sort of people to open their eyes Um uh, that gives them more context in terms of, um, you know, just how the world lives and some of the, you know, the, the inequality or disparities there. And so I think, um, I, I think, I think that is a driver of, uh, of change in mindset. Um, and then I also think there's, wh- wh- whether it's not next generation wealth, but it's whether it's wealth created from this generation for the first time, uh, which happens to be in your peer set as well. Um, I, I think just the mentality is slightly different. You know, the mentality is not around creating all that wealth. It's about creating change and the wealth is the byproduct of that. And so when you start seeing that around yourself, it also shapes, you know, even if, if you're coming from the next generation transfer, it shapes how the way you think about things. And so, um, you know, my, I have, I have faith and I, that, that I think people are aware and more understanding of like the real issues that sort of plague at the micro level, like your individual life and at the macro level, like the world. Um, uh, and at least from the conversations that I think people are just having you know, today, which are vastly different than they were having 20 years ago. Um, I, I, I also agree. I, I feel positive and promise, but all you can say is hope. Right. Um, but I think it's the last thing I'd say it, it, it's important then uh, for you to be a catalyst of that hope or at least spread the message. So you can be a catalyst of that hope for other people, because then through action, I think, that hope turns into reality. Yeah, it's important. A very, very important point you made as, as well, uh, uh, because as, uh, in, in particular as well, when you talked about being the catalyst of change is what created the wealth. It wasn't the wealth that created that. It was actually that focus on creating positive change that built that business and created that wealth to begin with. David Chang, I'll put the same question to you, so, to you as well. Inevitably, we'll look to, you know, top 1% on the patriarchal and what do you think that direction forward will be here i couldn't hear what you just said because you're you froze when you spoke did you okay, have, right. hear that David? Just, just the same question will the one percent uh continue to dominate um or do you feel this next generation is different and has a different legacy what do you and if so what do you think that is 
Okay. Well, I would say that a lot of the systems and structures that kind of are um, uh, set up the way they are um, in these different capacities, that, that they'll have a huge effect. And so sometimes it's not based on what the, how the individuals are dealing with uh, the challenges at, as well. Um, I would also say that uh, you know, when the divides become really intense, um, then there's the question of how do we actually have compassion for ourselves and for each other during these really challenging times. Um, often people tend to isolate more when things get very intense rather than isolate less. And so building bridges um, with people of different backgrounds and different perspectives becomes increasingly important. I also think that faith-based approaches, you know, I talked to some of my friends in different traditions. Um, for example, um, some of my Jewish friends uh, talk about tikkun, heal and repairing and restoring the world. Some of my Christian friends talk about uh, loving your neighbors yourself and the value of mercy and compassion. Um, I feel like things have to come from within. This is not something you can legislate. This is not something that you can put out as only uh, something that's going to be coming from, from, a, from an external place. A lot of people need to be able to connect on a much, a much deeper place in terms of intrinsic motivation. Um, because if it's not coming intrinsically, then it's often going to feel forced. People are often going to rebel against that. So you have at least half the country that is concerned about the consolidation of big tech and big media and big government. And for people in that perspective, um, there's going to be kind of a, a, a very um, defensive feeling and upset, uh, mm -hmm. uh, a feeling of upset, of course, around how things are maybe um, stacked up against um, more freedoms and more expressions. So how do we have a collective solidarity that on, honors the interests of the individual freedom, but um, at the same time uh, allows for the importance of knowing that we're all in this together, no matter Indeed. what measures that we need to engage. So it's about maintaining our soul as well as our society at the same time. Indeed, and, uh, and, and you made a good point, it. David, uh, about we're, we're all in this together. Just we're, we're, we're running uh, sort of uh, close to the Y here on this. David Herman, uh, yeah, again, I'd love you to sort of t take this one home sure. on, that, on that point. Uh, will the 1% end up controlling the majority? If not, how are the next generation different? And what do you think that direction forward will be? Great. Thank you, Peter. And I'll be as succinct as I can, given the time. Um, there's an incredible book by Jeremy Heinens and Henry Timms called New Power, the study of power dynamics boils down to we live currently in a world we think of as currency and castles. And thus the nature of your question, Peter, is an assumption that in that transfer, that castle mentality is maintained. And I believe the reality of the world, especially as David Chang mentioned with tech is we are in a world where it is a current. Me Too, Black Lives Matter, all of these different movements that have been sustained you can ride the wave, you cannot stop them. Therefore, I can't imagine a world where 1% will control in a world that seems very hard to control in that hierarchical or patriarchal system. And since every one of my friends here and many of my friends in this next gen space, they walk the walk where they give, where they invest. They are not removed from it. And if you are not removed from it, then you are engaged with it. So it's very hard to divorce yourself from the actual realities of the currents of change that need to happen. Mm -hmm. Very inspiring and, and very, very succinct. And yes, some really golden takeaways uh, uh, there, David Herman. And of, of course, from all of our panelists, I very much thank you for participating in this panel. We could go on and on and on. There's other Other questions are great depth, great context, and a deeper understanding of the heart, the mind, and the direction forward. And I think it would be in very intriguing and safe hands if every one of the next gens had the same uh, values and philosophy of life uh, that many of our next gens on this panel here possessed. Um, so this concludes our uh, great generational wealth transfer uh, panel discussion. It's been a tremendous honor to chair this uh, on behalf of the Harassus uh, uh, group. And a big thank you to David Herman for helping to uh, put this uh, panel together with a number of his uh, associates. Also, the dedicated staff of Harassus, uh, Chairman Frank Jurgen Richter, for his dedication and commitment 
into making any, this engaging virtual roundtable possible. Ladies and gentlemen, and our distinguished guests, I wish you great prosperity and safety during these uncertain times and a most exciting rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you all. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you all.